Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to our second part of our four-part series on lung ultrasound. My name is Dan Restrepo. I'm the Associate Residency Program Director for Point of Care Ultrasound in the Department of Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. So let's go ahead and get started. By the end of this session, I will have been successful if you can list the basic artifacts seen at the solid air interface and obtain basic views of the lung across all eight lung zones. So let's get started with artifacts and the healthy lung. So just a reminder that normal lung is mostly air and sound waves either scatter or reverberate between the air and the probe. And this generates a variety of artifacts. We're gonna cover those that are seen in the healthy lung here, which are A-lines and lung comets. Remember that normal lung has visceral and parietal pleura that apos and slide upon each other, and this creates the sonographic finding of lung sliding. In general, we try to visualize it between rib spaces since these dark, dense, and, and calcific structures often don't let sound through them. Now remember that air is the enemy of ultrasound, and normal lungs are full of air. So most of what we're seeing in a healthy lung is just the chest wall and everything that's deep to the pleura is artifact because the sound is never actually making it to the lung tissue that's deep to all of that air that we're seeing right deep to the pleura. And so we're going to start off with finding the bat sign. Okay. And so we're going to re recall back to our first section where we talked about this schematic that we have of a cross section of the chest wall. And we put the probe pointing towards the head in between the two ribs. Remember that the ribs should be calcific and dense and thus not let sound through them, and they create shadows behind them. These are known as rib shadows. But remember that the denser a structure is, the more sound is going to bounce off of it, and thus the brighter the picture is going to be. We expect to see these ridges over the ribs to be hyperechoic and bright. And again, the pleura is simply a layer of tissue that is above a bunch of air, and air is a really strong reflector. So your pleural line should be really bright. Now, if we advance the slide a little bit, and I'll show you just a quick image of a normal lung, or here is a, a depicted a still, you can see those two bright ridges with shadows behind them, which represent the ribs, and you see a bright horizontal line in between them, which is the pleura. And just remember that really the sound is just traveling to the pleura and back. And everything that's deep to that in the far field of the image is actually not really there. It's just an artifact. And here highlighted is the reason why we call it a bat sign, because it's oddly reminiscent of the caped crusader himself. Next up is lung sliding. And I alluded to this earlier, but lung sliding refers to um, the effect that we see when visceral and parietal pleura are apposed to each other and are sliding past one another during normal respiration. And tiny kind of microscopic little imperfections in the pleura manifest as teensy little ants marching on a log. And I'll call your eyes to these two examples here. Just uh, try to focus in on that bright pleural line and note these tiny little uh, granules that seem to be moving with respiration. And, and that is uh, what is uh, sonographic evidence of lung sliding, which is an important finding in evaluating for diagnoses like pneumothoraces. Okay, next up, we're going to cover reverberation artifact and A-lines. So we're going to return to our same cross section of the chest. We're going to put our probe again on the chest with the indicator to the head, and we'll get the rib shadows that we expect. Now recall that air is the enemy of ultrasound, and it's an incredibly strong reflector. And since the chest wall is usually not that thick, there's going to be a lot of bouncing back and forth of sound between the probe and the pleura. And as such, the same beam of sound is going to reverberate over and over and over again. And the machine is going to incorrectly interpret that as structures that are deeper and deeper and deeper within the lung. And so an example of that would be if a sound wave bounces back between the probe and the pleura, the probe is going to interpret that as a deep structure a little bit further down, because remember that the longer it takes for sound to return to the probe, the deeper the machine thinks the structure is. And we'll label that time one. Now you will continue to reverberate at time two. And again, since that took longer for that uh, sound to return to the probe, it's going to interpret it that's even deeper uh, than time one, and so on and so forth. 
and thus creates a horizontal artifact that's seen between rib spaces that's known as an A-line. And here's just a couple examples of A-lines. Now remember, you see the, you can kind of appreciate a teensy little bit of lung sliding if, if you look at the pleura, and then at equidistant depths from the pleura, you'll start to see these horizontal repeating artifacts that represent A lines. And remember that A, or a way to think about this is that A is A for air. And it simply just means that you're ensinating a an air-filled structure. Next up is lung comets. Lung comets are actual vertical artifacts that, that arise from the pleura but do not extend into the far field of the image. And they also represent sort of little irregularities in the pleural line that, that uh, cause artifacts with sound as it, as it traverses them. Um, it's important to note that uh, these artifacts don't go all the way into the far field, as I said. They do not obliterate A lines, and they do move with respiration, and, and they're going to differ from B lines in, in those ways. We're going to cover B lines a little bit later. They are fainter also than B lines, and they should be kind of hard to see without the linear probe, which gives you the highest resolution. Lung comets are actually a normal finding and a good indicator that pleura is apposed to pleura. Now, zones 1R, 2R, 3R, 1L, 2L, and 3L, so these zones here, should all look like this. You should be looking for a bat sign. But how about when we get down into the bases of the lung in zones 4R and 4L? Well, in this diagram, I have, if you were to imagine a CT scan, giving you kind of a, a schematic of the abdomen and the lower chest with the diaphragm and that, that dome-shaped structure. The ridges of the spine is the most posterior structure in the belly and the chest, and then the liver and the kidney. We're going to be placing our probe kind of somewhere around where we imagine the liver is, again, with the indicator of the chest, and our sound should be going in this direction. Now it's important to remember that air is the enemy of ultrasound, which means that a normal healthy lung should have air going all the way up to that diaphragmatic dome, and thus that no sound should be really able to reach the spine that you see that's cephalad to the diaphragm. And so we're just going to play a little spatial game. We're going to tilt this over a little bit, kind of how it's going to show up on your screen. And again, that probe is going to be insinating the right upper quadrant and the base of the right lung. And it's going to look a little something like this, with the L standing for liver, the curvy dome of the diaphragm, that hyperechoic sort of C-looking structure it, towards the left side of the, of the image, and then bright, bright ridges in the back indicating the spine. And it's a super important point is that we should always strive to find the spine because we now know we are in the most posterior recesses of the chest. It's going to look something like this. Again, picture those, those, right, those bright ridges in the back of the far field of the image giving way to this curvy diaphragm that comes off the top that should be bright hyperechoic uh, with the isoechoic or gray liver and the liver and the kidney picture right there. On the left, it should be the exact same thing, except that now you're looking at a spleen as opposed to a liver. And again, I'll just call your eyes to the fact that there's an isoechoic spleen, bright ridges in the back, which are the spine that give way up to that curvy hyperechoic diaphragm. And your picture, again, should come from, should look something like this. Next up is lung curtain. And so you're gonna, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but you just need to remember that air is the enemy of ultrasound. So if the patient is going to take a deep breath in, you're going to extend, you're going to sort of expand the chest and bring the lung down towards the abdomen. And thus you're going to bring that uh, lower lobes of the lung, those lower lobes of the lung into the field of insonation and you're going to lose your picture. And this creates sort of what looks like a curtain and as I'll show you right here. So as they breathe, you lose the picture and as they breathe out, it goes, it comes back. And this is what's known as a lung curtain. It's often a good sign that there's not a large pleural effusion at the bases of the lungs. And so with that, we conclude our second section on uh, lung ultrasound. Make sure you check out the next one where we're going to be talking about pneumothorax and pleural effusion evaluation.